Deuteronomy chapter 15, stand for the reading of the word and starting in verse 12. Thank you, God. Praise you, Lord. If your brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, is sold to you and serves you six years, then in the seventh year you shall let him go free from you. And when you send him away free from you, you shall not let him go away empty-handed. And you shall supply him liberally from your own flock, from your threshing floor, from your wine press, from what the Lord has blessed you with, you shall give to him. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore I command you this thing today. And if it happens that he says to you, I will not go away from you because he loves you, and your house, since he prospers with you. Then you shall take an awl and thrust it through his ear on the door, to the door, and he shall be your servant forever. And also your female servant, you shall do likewise. And it shall not seem hard to you when you send him away free from you, for he has been worth a double hired servant in serving you six years. Then the Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. May God add his blessing to reading the word. You may be seated. We're going to examine the final aspect of the smita, the invitation to become a bond servant for Jesus. And we need to finish up. This is our last and four-part series on the smita year. The response to this has been a little overwhelming for me. I, I'm, I'm shocked at the people that listen to this message on Facebook and, and have wanted more information. And and so we're going to bring it to a conclusion. So the two elements of the Smita that I want to finish up with is one is the Jubilee, seven Smitas, and then begins the Jubilee year. The Hebrew word for Jubilee is Teruah. And the scripture in Leviticus 25, 8 and 9 says, and you shall count seven Sabbaths of years, that's the Smita for yourself, seven times seven years, and the time of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be for you 49 years. And then you shall cause the trumpet of jubilee, there's the word there, teruah, to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month on the day of atonement. And you shall make the trumpet to sound throughout all of your land. After seven uh, sevens of years, the, when you enter into the 50th year, you enter into what's called the jubilee year. It begins on the tenth day of Tishri, our most holy month, and it, which happens to be Yom Kippur or the day of atonement. A lot of prophecy scholars believe that this will be the day that Jesus will come back on Rosh Hashanah, which is the first day, the Feast of Trumpets, the first day of Tishri. And on the 10th day, the Day of Atonement will be the beginning of the tribulation for the Jews. And then, of course, we know that the Feast of Tabernacles, which occurs in the 15th of the month, will be when Jesus comes back and establishes his government here on earth. We prove to you, to you, that to you from the Zechariah the prophet. So... These days are important for us to remember. But jubilee is a concept that we need to try to grasp. Smitas are to years what Sabbaths are to days. In other words, seven days and you have a Sabbath, seven years and you have a Smita year. And jubilee is to Smitas what Pentecost is to Sabbaths. Seven Sabbaths in one day is Pentecost. Seven Smitas in one year is jubilee. So I want you to get this timeline, and I encourage you to get your pen out and write some of these dates down because they're going to be very pivotal in your life. Uh, so you need to get a timeline concept. Since we're in the Smita year, we told you it started on the first of Tishri this year. The 29th of Elul, which is the day of remission of the Smita year, we've talked about that. It's when all debts are released. It's more than likely when our stock market will develop real serious problems. we will be on September 13th of the year 2015. This is the day of release, the last day of the Smita year. Interesting enough, we'll have a partial solar eclipse that day. You know that the sun is a sign to the nations and uh, the moon is a sign to Israel. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, will be on September 23rd of 2015 and that is the beginning of the Jubilee. This is a very important date. That's when the Jubilee for God's people begins. And of course, Sukkot, a feast we just celebrated, which will be the last blood moon, will be on September 28th 
of that year. So you see beginning in September, you have a series of events in 2015 that are very important. The 13th is the day of remission, the last day of the Smita year. The 23rd is the first day of the Jubilee. And the 28th is the last blood moon. Interesting about Genesis 1-4, it talks about God said, I created everything. I put the moon and the stars and the sun in the heavens for a sign and a season. And the word there, the Hebrew word there for sign is othe. It means omen. It can also be interpreted as omen. And the word there for feast in that passage or seasons in that passage, I put them out there for the signs and the seasons. The word for seasons is moadim. It's exactly the same word that they use for feast in Leviticus when they established the feast days. So let's retranslate Genesis 114. The sun, moon, and stars are for omens on the feast days. Amen? When you have lunar eclipses and solar eclipses that occur on the feast days, you know God is trying to communicate something to you, and we've been all, all over that. By now, you should have that by heart. But <clears throat> it's, just, it's just interesting to me the number of people that are confused about what the blood moons are ushering in because they don't understand the concept of jubilee. If you understand the concept of Jubilee, you'll understand the timing of what God's doing much better. The interesting about this word teruah, which means Jubilee, is interpreted as Jubilee, Jubilee in Leviticus 25 that I just read you. In Jeremiah 4.19, Jeremiah said, Oh, my soul, oh, my soul, I am pained in my very heart. My heart makes a noise within me. Can I, I cannot hold my peace because you have heard, my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm for war. It's the word taruah again. So what is, what, is, what is the scripture trying to tell us here? The taruah is a blast of the trumpet. It's God's battle war cry. And when, when you hear the battle war cry, the alarm uh, on, on the day of Jubilee, that it's telling you that God is about to initiate a battle. Can I get a witness out of somebody? And what he's fighting over this jubilee is financial assets. God is about to initiate an action where he begins to bring finances from the world back into his kingdom. And when you hear that trump trumpet, when you, when you understand jubilee, you better be ready because you're, God is about to unleash a mega smita. When you think of jubilee, think of a mega smita. Leviticus 25.10 says, You shall consecrate the 50th year, proclaim liberty throughout all the land and all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee to you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and each of you shall return to his family. God placed the provision for his people on the earth when he created it, and the devil usurped it. He stole it. He took it without authorization, and he built his own kingdom. The financial Babylonian system that we have in place today in the world is not built on the principles of God or on his laws. It's built on a system of supplying an insatiable lust. 1 John 2.16, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the sole motivation of the Babylonian financial system that is operating all over the world today is to satisfy, create and satisfy lust that will generate sales, that will generate wealth. I challenge you to watch a beer commercial. You understand what I'm saying? They don't have any ugly girls in the beer commercial. Amen, hallelujah. They don't have Hilda from Oktoberfest, you know, that weighs 300 pounds and, you know, and said, boy, beer is really good. I really like it. You should buy some. No, they're trying to create a lustful sort of a, in men, they're trying to create, they don't ever use anything but girls in beer commercials. Have you ever noticed that? Hallelujah. That's because young men drink most of the beer. That's the way the world system, and we laugh, but that's basically the way the system offer, operates. Their motivation of the Babylonian system is to generate profit from stimulating lustful desire and then satisfying it endlessly. Basically, you're an addict. You're an addict to consumerism. Thank God I've been delivered from that lustful desire of those new Ford pickups that smell so good and have the colors. Have you seen the new colors that they have? Ford knows how to create a lustful desire for their product. Come on, somebody. This is the way the world system works. And it, it's the sole motivation. 
And their whole system is built on this lustful desire and this fulfillment of self. The, the world system is very selfish. And another thing about that, they don't have, really have your best interest at heart. Whenever you hear the term, well, you know, it's just business, you know what comes next, hallelujah. I see some of you haven't been in business long enough to hear that term. Some of the worst deals I ever got into in my life proceeded with the phrase, well, it's just business. Let me tell you about God's financial system. God's financial system is built on the concept of stewardship. The land, he said in Leviticus 25, 23, he said, the land shall not be sold permanently for the land is mine for you are strangers and sojourners with me. Everything you have belongs to him. Everything that I have belongs to him. And you know what? I'm just a steward of what he's given me to steward. This is God's financial system. And his economic system is built on the principle of stewardship and the stewards take care of it so as to deliver the goods to society, the goods. My economic teacher said the definition of economics is any enterprise that organizes labor and material in the most efficient way possible to deliver goods and services to society. God's financial system, Brother Roy, is to deliver the goods to society. What goods? Health care, food, shelter, clothing, the necessities of life. God, God, creates, God creates an economic system. See, God is a businessman. He understands economics. And he wanted to create a system where we saw ourselves just as stewards. And our goal was to do something beneficial for society, to help society. And this is the thing. See, profit can never be the only motivation for business. Milton Friedman wrote a book, and I read it several times. It's a great book, except I disagree with this one thing. He said the only motivation for business is to maximize profit, and that's wrong. Let me tell you, the only motivation for business is to provide the goods for society. You have to make a profit, though, to do that. So a profit is essential, but it's not the objective. Really, we talk about advertising. Look at the advertising of successful companies and see what they advertise. They don't advertise uh, self. They never tell you that. They never advertise, say, buy our stuff so we can get rich, do they? They, 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 they tell you that they're based on, on, on what's good for you. They want to serve you. They want to be a servant to you. That's the way a business ought to be run. God's business model is not profit-oriented, but profit is important and it's essential to sustain a business. But it's oriented around this concept of delivering the goods to society in, a, in an efficient and organized way. The stewards take the provision that he placed on the earth from the beginning and they have talents that they use to, 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 to maximize its effect and deliver the goods to the rest of the people. A guy named John Rustin in 1860, wrote something that I, I just found the other day that floored me. He said, there are five essential intellectual pursuits in a society for a society to flourish. Remember our word flourish. He said, the soldier's got to defend it. The pastor has to teach it. The physician has to keep it healthy. The lawyer has to protect it from injustice. And the steward has to provide for it. And all of these must be willing to die for it. The soldier dies before he abandons his post. The pastor must choose death over compromising truth. The physician can never abandon his post in plague. How many of you have seen that in this Ebola epidemic? A healthcare worker in Texas has been tested positive just yesterday, late last night. How many healthcare workers in West Africa have died? I think it's up over 300. They are giving their lives to the society that they live in. He says the, the lawyer must choose death before compromising on justice. And the steward must place his best interest, make them subordinate to the needs of the society. Amen. This is God's financial system. And the Jubilee marks a return of God's people to the inheritance and to the basic thing that created the wealth to begin with, and that was the land. God said, this is my land. I'm letting them use it to prosper themselves, to flourish in it. It's a recovery of what 
has been lost. That's what the Jubilee is. You know, you could be farming and you could have a drought or you could have something bad happen to you and you had to mortgage your farm to a neighbor and you couldn't make the payments and he ended up taking it over and, and so you lost the family farm. Well, after 50 years, that has to come back into your family. This is God's fun. It's, the, it's God's redistribution of wealth is what it is. He makes sure every 50 years that you get, your family gets, your, 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 your heirs get a chance to start over. Recovering of the timing of the Jubilee is a little bit tricky, though, because the rabbis lost count of the, of the, of the Jubilee after the, after the captivity in Babylon and were shipped to Babylon. And they had placed themselves under the Smita judgments because they had not observed the Smita, so they were taken off the land and they were taken into Babylon. And in that period of captivity, they really lost track of when the Jubilee actually was. And the, and the reason that they recovered the timing of the Smita is they were smart enough to figure out that they went into captivity on a Smita year and they were liberated on a Smita year. So from uh, 516 BC, when they went back into Jerusalem, you can start that as a Smita year and you can count and it gets you all the way to this year that we're going through right now. But the, but the timing of the, of, the, of the Jubilee has been kind of lost. But experts, and I'm not one, but I... I've read the experts, and the experts say that the way they recovered the timing of the Jubilee, remember the Jubilee is about God's people returning to their inheritance. And I'm here to declare to you today, and I'll do it on the internet, and I'll do it whatever. You understand this? Jerusalem belongs to the Jews because it belongs to God. Can I get a witness out of somebody? So you can go to Jerusalem, and you can study the history of Jerusalem, and you can pick up the timing of the Jubilee. In 1917, the English drove the Ottomans out of Jerusalem in the early phases of World War II, and they wrote a Balfour Declaration. Balfour was the, the minister of, of uh, state there in England, and he declared that Palestine was a homeland to the Jews. So that's, that's, that's a miraculous event, and it's the fulfillment of this, of this returning of the inheritance back to the Jews. And it happened in the Hebrew year of 5678. Don't let that freak you out. God has a different calendar than you do. 5678 is when it happened. Now, the timing of the Jubilee is interesting because I'm, I'm maybe boring you with these facts, but I really want you to have a real understanding of how this works. So seven Smitas, every seven years, 49 years, you begin the Jubilee year. It begins on Yom Kippur of the next year. But that Jubilee year is the first year of the next set of seven. So the, the, the cycle of redemption with the Jubilee is actually 49 years. Think about that. So, so if you take 49 years from, uh, from the Hebrew year of 5678, it brings you to 5627, which was the very day or year of the Six-Day War in Israel, when one of the things of the Six-Day War was they defeated their Arab enemies in six days miraculously. They still write about the miracles of this war, and they regained... See, the, see, even though Balfour declared that this was a homeland to the Jews, the Arabs said they can't have Jerusalem. They can't have Jerusalem. So they made Tel Aviv their capital because they had no access to Jerusalem. Well, in, in exactly the next jubilee... The Six-Day War broke out, which they won miraculously at the conclusion of that Smita year, the beginning of the Jubilee. They won the Six-Day War in a miraculous fashion, and they regained control of the west half of Jerusalem. Today, the Jews are in the western half of Jerusalem, and Lebanon is in the eastern half. Now, it's interesting and anecdotal, but the dude up there at the Midland, at the, at the, at the radio, at the TV station, Al... Cooper. Al Cooper told me a story about a friend of his who was in the Israeli army, and he said they actually had taken over the Temple Mount. He was a captain of a regiment during the Six-Day War. And they went into the Temple Mount, and they were standing in the mosque. And they were fixing to drive the Israeli flag into the ground and defend that baby. They had captured it, and their commander said, get out of there. If we take that over now, every Arab nation in the world will align and come after us and we'll, have, we'll be worse than we were. Get out of there and let that go back. I'm not sure that that was God's will, by the way, but it was politics. And so, so, so they, they basically ceded control of the eastern half of Jerusalem to Lebanon to try to keep the Arabs happy. But this is more recovering of that which was lost. So you have some dates you can use here. You have 1917, you have 1967, which would be uh, the year 5727, and you add 50 years to that, or 49 years to that to, the, to make the cycle, and you come up with the 23rd of September in the year 2015. 
That would be the Hebrew year, 1576. So this is why we have strong evidence to suggest that we have a jubilee coming up. Oh, that's great, guy. I can tell you love history, but I mean, really, I'm not into that. You better get into it, and you better get into it quick. Because everything around you is about to start to shake. Can I get a witness out of somebody? If you don't know what God's doing, you'll run like a scared girl. My point is, is you can try to act tough, but it will not get it done in this age, in this, in this time that we're coming into. You have to understand what God is doing so you don't freak out. This is what God says in Haggai 2, 6 and 7. The Lord says of hosts, he gave this, he gave this prophecy to the prophet Haggai in the month of Tishri, the holy month, the month when all this is going to happen. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, I will shake the heaven and the earth, the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations. When you think of nations, it's interesting, the word for nations is the same word as Gentile. It's Gohim. To the Hebrew mind, they're one and the same. I'll shake the nations and they shall come to the desire of all nations and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine and God is bringing it back into his kingdom. The devil stole it for all these years, built an economic system on it that's, that's destructive and God's coming to get it back. The Babylonian system basically is built on stolen property. To usurp means to appropriate without authorization. And the devil's been using this provision all these years. And the season of increase for God's people will coincide with the season of collapse for the world's Babylonian system. You watch what I'm telling you. Roger and I were just talking to that, or maybe Bill, I don't know a while ago. In this region in 2008, they had a mortgage crisis that nearly brought the banking system to its knees around the world. I've read a lot of accounts of our government leaders going in the bathroom and just having to throw up because they just didn't think there's any way we could survive. See, you, you're, the thing, my goal here is is to get you we're not so oblivious to what's going on financially. And you're, you're wise to the events and have understanding of them and know what God's people ought to do. And so they were this close to collapse of the world's economy because they had bad mortgage debt all over the place. They had AIG that was in a hole. They had Lehman Brothers that had gone under. They had Bear Stearns. They'd lost them. They started to list all these mortgage companies. Goldman, the great icon of Wall Street, was going to be next. And they had to intervene and hope for the best. In Emerald, Texas, Emerald National Bank, which is a regional bank, makes lots of home loans, lots of mortgages. In the year 2008, Emerald, Texas, in the collapse, the calamity, that nearly brought Bank of America to its knees. Emerald National lost three loans, had three bad loans. The city of Amarillo, the uh, building slowed down for about 24 hours. I don't, those guys must have went and got a beer or something. I don't know. When they came back, they were just going like crazy again. My good friend uh, who's in the building business over there, I talked to him a year or so ago, and I said, how would you make it through it? And he said, I built 500 houses last year. He said, our business has doubled every year since 2008. This region is, it's a bifurcation. Economists call it a bifurcation. You have two economies that are starting to separate. You have God's economy and you have the Babylonian economy. God's economy is starting to take off. God's people in the region of the hill land are experiencing prosperity while the rest of the nation is struggling. Hallelujah. Can I get a witness out of somebody? So increase of God's people will bring about, coincide with this repossession process where God begins to shake things and shake things loose from the world system. Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. I got news for you. If you are righteous and in the correct place with God, your children will not inherit debt. They will inherit prosperity. Can I get a witness out of somebody? They will inherit blessing because God has made that provision for them. God cares about the perpetuation of prosperity and wealth from generation to generation. That's why he invented the Smita. That's why he invented the Jubilee. Make no mistake, the season of increase is just about really primarily about finances. So you're going to see this shaking. And when you do, you need the shalom of God. Psalm 23. 
The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul for his great name's sake. He leads me in paths of righteousness. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't fear any evil. For you're with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You make them watch while you bless me. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the shalom of God. This is the well-being. This is the peace of God. You need that to survive what's ahead, to keep you from freaking out and entering into fear. What did you first think? What did you first think when you heard there was an Ebola patient in Dallas? Mothers, what did you think? Oh, my God. I hope his kids didn't go to school up there. They got schools. I can't get anybody to attend anymore because this guy's children or children he had access to were in the school system. Fear, fear begins to break out everywhere. What you need to understand is, is that you're living in an area that's, while the rest of the world is being shaken, God has provided for you here. And this peace that you have is characterized because you have a lack of want. You don't have want in your life. You have confidence in what the Lord's doing in you. You have confidence in the place that he has you. You have confidence that he is, you are living in a healed, restored land. And 2 Timothy 1.7 said, God hadn't given us a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and sound mind. Jesus warned you. He said, don't be anxious for anything. You know why? Because you get stupid when you get anxious. Oh, I added that part, but that's what he meant, hallelujah. <laughs> you can't learn when you're anxious. You're not creative when you're anxious. You, you become numb when you get anxious. You start bumping into things and doing stupid things. You run stop signs. You do all of that when you're anxious. You know what you need to do? You need to relax, hallelujah. You just need to relax, and you need to know that God is in control. From the beginning of time, he's been in control. And the shaking that you're seeing is a little scary to watch, but it doesn't affect you. Franklin Roosevelt said the only thing that you have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. The citizens of the heel land will convert retreat into advance. The world will be retreating, but you'll be increasing. Can I get a witness out of somebody? If you stay in faith, you're going to continue to advance. But if you, get, if you get where you're not living on faith and you get in the flesh, you're going to be afraid. If you can find Habakkuk chapter 2, you need to find it because I need to read this. This is very important. This is pivotal. A guy gave us this word for this vision years and years ago. And it's one we've got we to gotta really put in our hearts and we've got to really, we really focus on what this prophet is saying here. Habakkuk 2. It's back there in the Minor Prophets. I know y'all spent a lot of time reading them. There's 12 of them. They're all good. Especially for the time we're living in. Can I just tell you something? You ought to be camping out in Zechariah. Zechariah has more to say about what you're going through right now than any prophet in the whole Bible. You ought to be reading it continuously. Especially Zechariah 10 through 14. Habakkuk 2, 2 and 4 says, The Lord answered me and he said, The prophet said, he said, write this vision and make it plain on the tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end, it'll speak and it'll not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come and it will not tarry. Here's what he's saying. Write the vision down so that people walk in here, they can look up and they can see what the vision is. And then they read it and then they get the vision. And when they get the vision, they begin to run with it. You know what that means? They begin to act like they believe the vision. They begin to, it begins to have impact on their life. It begins to reflect what they do. Their decisions are made based on the vision. 
So when you read the vision, run with the vision, and remember that God has, is going to bring it to pass. He says, though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. That's a strange deal. Here's what the prophet is trying to say to you. He's trying to say to you, though it seems like it's taking a long time, it's really right on schedule. Can I get a witness with somebody? And it's going to accomplish what the prophet told you it was going to accomplish in your life. And here he says this, he says, remember this though. Behold the proud, his soul's not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. You're not going to be able to live by any other thing. You're going to have to live by your faith. And I want to I wanna I wanna jump over here to verse 14 and throw this in. There's just a little caveat here. I want to declare this and decree this over you. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord, just like the water covers the sea. God's glory is going to cover this whole earth. And you know how it's going to cover this whole earth? You know how he's going to do that? She's going to lead somebody to the Lord and she's going to make a disciple out of them. They're going to go out and they're going to lead 12 to the Lord. They're going to make disciples of all of them. It's going to begin to spread over the earth one at a time. Every one of you who's in here has got one purpose in this life and that is to make disciples. And your disciples are going to go out and they're going to, they're going to have impact and they're going to begin to subvert the world's systems and they're going to rise up through broken systems and they're going to begin to bring the leading and guiding of the Holy Ghost to bear on our education, to bear on our government, to bear on our health care systems. You know what our health care system? It needs the power of the Holy Ghost. It needs leadership by the Spirit of God. They sent a guy in who had been from Western Africa and they sent him home. Somebody needs to be hearing from the Holy Ghost. Somebody needs to let the Holy Spirit, the wisdom of the Holy Spirit begin to inflect, inflect decision-making in our healthcare system. How's that going to happen? The whole world is going to have knowledge of the glory. I didn't say, it didn't say they were all going to get saved. A lot of them are though. But they're going to have knowledge of the glory because God's people are going to be leading. They're going to be leading the government. They're going to be leading the systems of governance that have failed how? Is that going to happen? You're going to go out and you're going to make disciples. They're going to go and they're going to have influence. Amen? So the thing that can break down all of what God's doing in our life is if we get in fear instead of faith because that's the opposite of faith is fear. I had dinner with some friends, Carol and I did, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, it was Friday. And we were talking about what God's doing. Everywhere I go, people just want to, it's an interrogation. I mean, people want to ask me, you know, uh, and that's okay. I'm glad about that. And I really am. But this one person just wanted more proof. And I said, look, you know, the thing you have to understand is Chuck Pierce, Kim Clement, these are some great prophets of God that have prophesied what's happening in our region. And she goes, yeah, but I want somebody besides Chuck Pierce. <laughs> I go, well, you know, at some point decide, you have to decide you're going to believe what God's people are telling you. Amen? Come on. You just have to make an agreement with it and decide you're going to believe it. But she said, I'd like to hear someone else. I'd just like to hear someone else. So I said, well, what about me? I've been believing it for 16 years. I said, yeah, man. She just kept eating. Praise God. <laughs> I didn't take it personal. You know what I'm saying? Prophets without honor in his own, you know, backyard. And so, but, but when I got home, Mandy, the next morning, Mandy said, Dad, you need to read this. This is a prophecy from my good friend, Todd Bentley. We're not really friends, but we are kind of strange. I'll tell you that story sometime. But Todd Bentley came up with this, and he says that God is creating a Goshen, a land called Goshen, where, which means drawing to God. And here's what he said. The Bible says that more than three million people came out of Goshen, and not one of them was sick, not one or feeble among all the tribes. And Goshen is a place of divine safety, blessing, protection, regardless of the Egypt that you're in right now and the judgments that are falling. God has a Goshen. He has a place to nourish you. He has a place he wants you to prosper. He has a fertile land where you will plunder the gold and the silver of the Egyptians and the wealth that belongs to the wicked is now going to come to you. Can I get a witness out of somebody? And this is a place. This is, this is a place, he kept saying. This is a place of Goshen. It's a place of increase. 
This is a place that God has delivered you from all your troubles. This is a place of double fruitfulness. This is from the prophet. How many, how many do you need? How many do you need to hear before you make an agreement with what God's doing? Amen? It's a place for you, Brother Bo. God sent you here and he saved you here. He didn't send you here to punish you. He sent you here to bless you. Amen? This is the thing that we've just got to make an agreement with. We have to understand that we're in the final part of what God's plan is. And we have to understand exactly what this meat is, where we are, and the jubilee is about to begin. That which has been stolen from God's people is about to be returned to them. And the way God redeems, the way that God redeems assets is it comes into your possession. When it comes into your possession, now it's in the kingdom. You need to start keeping your eyes and ears open for opportunity while the rest of the world is wanting to quit and run. You need to be looking for doors to open, and there's going to be a bunch of them. Amen? The final part of the Smita, though, that I want to talk to you about, watch for Jubilee. We're going to talk about that a lot as time goes along, but this release from slavery, Deuteronomy 15, 12. If a brother, a Hebrew man or woman, is sold to you and serves you six years, in the seventh year, you let him go free. The way they dealt with bad debt back then, they didn't have a bankruptcy court when you lost everything, you basically became an indentured servant to whoever had loaned you the money for a period of time. But their concept of slavery, the biblical concept of slavery in God's people is a whole lot different than the world's view of it. Because here's what it says in 12:13: When you send him away and you release him, don't send him away empty-handed. Supply him liberally from your own flock, threshing floor and wine press, from what the Lord has blessed you with. You shall give him, and then the Lord will bless you. On the smeet the year, on the day of release, everybody who had made bad business deals, everybody who had lost their inheritance, everybody that had to be an indentured servant to pay their debts off, God said, let them go. But don't send them away empty-handed. Bless them. Let them start over. How many of you need to start over in your life or have had to start over at some point in your life? Come on. Amen. That's God's plan is you have an opportunity to start over. But he says this, and this is really interesting. He says in 16, he said, but if it happens, he says to you, I don't want to go away from you because he loves you and your house and he's prospered with you. See, this is not, sla- this is not the world's definition of slavery. This is where the guy actually, you've been giving him a few ewes along as he helped you take care of the sheep and now he's got his own little herd. And he says, I don't want to go anywhere. I want to stay here and I want to work for you. I want to work for you. I want to raise my family here because you're good to me. This is what the scripture says. Take an awl and put it through his ear. Mark him, and he'll always be your bondservant. Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, he says, you can't be a bondservant to Jesus and a pleaser of men. At some point in time, you have to get where you don't care what men think. At some point in time, you have to say, I don't care what the world thinks. I don't care what men think. I'm going to serve Jesus. I want to be a bond servant. And you said, well, I got saved. I already did. No, no, no. I'm talking about a commitment level that goes way beyond just getting saved. And your emotions will lead you into the graveyard. Come on, somebody. You can't be moved by your emotions. You have to be so sold out in the spirit that your commitment level to the spiritual life is so high that your emotions just don't move you. Ryan White was an associate of Todd Bentley, and and he taught that night, and he taught on becoming a bond servant. He said the problem, he said this, and it was ministers, folks. Now, there were a lot of people there, but these were ministers from around the world. He said, the problem with you people is you haven't had the experience I had where I had a place in my ministry where God reached out and touched me and said, I'm going to let you go if that's what you want to do. Or you can choose to stay. But if you do, I'm going to mark you. If you stay, it's going to be all or nothing. If you stay, you're going to be a bond servant. And Ryan White began to describe this experience where he had this encounter with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit basically marked him 
And he said, you know, there are a lot of things that I would like to do and a lot of things I'd like to try, but I can't do nothing but what I'm doing because I'm a bond servant to Jesus Christ. And he gave this invitation. And I knew then why I had come because I knew that I was at that place where I'm not too sure that I wasn't ready to go. If Jesus had said, you can either go or you can stay, but if you stay, it's all in. You're going to become a bond servant. It was a pivotal time in my life. And God was saying, I'll release you. I'll even bless you when you go. But if you stay, you can't ever look back. And so he gave an invitation and I went to the front. Oh my God. I've had some encounters with the Holy Ghost, but none one like that. And Carol went up too. And I, when I got to her, she was just vibrating like a tuning fork. I mean, the Holy Spirit was all over both of us. And that, that day I told the Lord, I really want to be a bond servant. I don't care where I go. See, that's the thing about a bond servant. A bond servant does what the master says, whether he likes it or not. If I have to leave the church, I'll leave the church. But I really do want to become a bond servant to you. I believe in it. You've called me to this place in Florida, thousands of miles away. You've called me to this moment to settle this issue in my heart once and for all. Once and for all, I'm all in. And I'm not ever going to look back. It was a powerful experience. I came back, and the first thing I remember, they were up there warming up, Roger and Bill were warming up, and, you know, they were going, hey, man, how was it? Was it was a lot. And I'm going, you know, it was just strange. <laughs> it wasn't like I thought at all, you know. Uh, Did you see anybody get raised from the dead, you know? I didn't, you know. I, to tell you the truth, I didn't see anything except the Lord drawing me to that altar. Roger and Bill did a <clears throat> revival at a local church here that next month. And I didn't tell this story to anybody. I didn't even tell them this story. And so no one knew but Carol about this experience I'd had. And Roger called me and said, won't you come over there and preach one night? And I said, okay. So I went over there and I preached and it was a great meeting and they did a great, they had a great revival over there. And a guy came up to me that I've known for a long time that goes to that church. The next day, I went over there the next day just to help be around and he didn't, he didn't, we didn't talk the night that I preached. The altar was busy. There was a lot of people up there. And the next day I went over there to help Roger and Bill. And I wasn't preaching. No one. He caught me. And he grabbed me by the hand and he looked at my ear. And he said, I knew it. I said, you knew what? He said, my wife told me that you had a diamond stud earring in your ear. I said, no, he don't have, not Guy Walker. He don't have no diamond stud. She said, I can see it. And he said, I looked up there and I could see a twinkle in your earlobe. He was seeing in the spirit what God had done. I began to weep. He goes, man, I didn't mean to make you mad. I told her you didn't really have one. I said, no, you don't get it, man. I'm telling you, there's somebody in here today that God's calling you to a higher level. I think he's telling you today, if you want to cut and run, take off. He'll bless you on the way out. But if you want to become a bond servant, if you want to give him the rest of your life, if you're willing to serve Jesus no matter who it draws you to or tears you away from, and here's the rest of my story. I had no idea what real blessing was until God, I gave it up and said, I'm all in God no matter what. God began to bless our ministry. He began to bless our life. He began to bless our marriage. He began to bless us financially. But that's not the reason to do this. None of that's the reason to do this. The reason to do this is because you love Jesus and you want to serve him and you believe in what he's trying to do on the earth. Amen. Come on, give God a praise. Now, I was in ministry, but the Lord showed me there were guys on that altar that were all around there, men and women, must have been hundreds of them. And the Lord showed me they ain't all ministers. Some of them are physicians, are lawyers, are 
soldiers or stewards. There's all kinds of ways to serve the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. But I think what God wants to know today is, where are you? Are you out or are you in? And that's what I've come here to do today is to tell you this is the year of the Smita. This is the year of the release. You can decide today. You're either all in with God. And, and, and I don't want to put pressure on you. Maybe some of you have already had this experience and you don't need it again. You only get one earring. Maybe you've already had the experience and, and you know that you're all in. But if you don't, today's the day of decision. I'm not talking about getting saved. I'm talking about going all in.